Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us for another Bruseum Happy Hour virtual lecture. Uh, I'm Liz with the Bruseum, and um, I'm excited for tonight's program. Uh, Bill Savage, who is a good friend, drinking buddy, uh, uh, master of all things at Northwestern University and on our national advisory board, um, is kicking off the first ever Bruseum book club. Um, I will start out by saying that this evening's uh, gathering is not two hours. Um, it was originally meant to be two hours when we were going to be uh, together in person at the Red Lion Pub. Um, so we'll be concluding at 7.30. Uh, Bill will uh, chat about uh, the Old Time Saloon. Um, you can put questions in the chat and he'll get to them at the end. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, one thing I will tell you is that we, of course, are doing programming weekly, uh, usually twice per week. Um, this Thursday, uh, I'll be leading a chat with Tremaine Atkinson of CH Distillery to talk about the history and culture of Malort. Um, next Tuesday, Australian beer historian Peter Simons will be discussing the history of Australian beer and how certain styles change over time. And um, I'm also pleased to let you know that Bill and I have chosen the second uh, book and date for Bruseum Book Club. So um, save the date of, uh, it is May 19th, May 19th, and the book will be The Sun Also Rises. Um, so switching it up quite a bit. But anyway, I'm gonna let Bill take over. Um, thanks again for joining us. Make sure you guys share what you're drinking. I'm drinking off colors. You can't take me anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and, the ultimate, ultimate self-quarantine beer. <laughs> right. And um, we'll get going, ah! ask your questions, and we'll chat again later. Thanks for joining us. I am having All the World is Here, a uh, beer that Liz collaborated on Temperance Brewing Company with. <coughs> and I was just having a pretzel and I think I inhaled a piece of salt down the wrong pipe, which is great. Um, so let me just say, this is a small enough group that I wanna just ask a question. And I see a lot of you have muted your visual, which is fine. Um, but I, I get the impression most of you have read the book. I'm getting some nods. Those of you who are uh, muting your image, that's fine. It just changes things slightly if I know that. and. I suspect this might be one reason why we maybe have fewer people than we had last time for just a happy hour. People might think you have to have read the book to be here. Okay, so Peter hasn't read it. All right. Um, but that's not the case. Like any good book club, show up, have a drink, relax and enjoy yourself is the, is the motto. Um, so my plan is just to talk a little bit about uh, George Aid's career. We'll give you a little background on him as a writer. Um, talk about how... Uh, <clears throat> this edition happened, um, which I might start with, and then delve into aspects of the book I find most remarkable. Uh, the history leading up to Prohibition, which again, I know some of you are very familiar with and some of you might not be as familiar with. Um, the crazy politics of all this and how some of this might be applicable to the world we live in right now. Um, so I have to do my standard disclaimer. I have political opinions. I'll be expressing my political opinions. They are mine and mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Northwestern University, the Chicago Museum, the Newbury Library of Chicago, or Major League Baseball. It's just me. Um, but issues that we're confronting right now in the COVID-19 world and the politics of the United States of America during this particular moment resonate very powerfully with the buildup to, and maybe to some degree, the aftermath of prohibition um, in ways that I think are worth talking about. Um, so given that I know some of you have read the book, I might go a little quicker through the book and leave more time for a conversation. Um, because again, with this size group, we can manage a one-on-one. -on -one. I've been teaching, I've been teaching two classes at Northwestern, a uh, class with 30 students and it doesn't really work for a conversation. And again, my image just froze. Did you keep going? Yes, okay. Um, but this side, I'm also teaching a class with 11 students in it where I can see everybody at once. So a conversation then is really very doable. There's a little raise your hand button you can hit that we can work with. And uh, I prefer a conversation to a lecture anyway. But to jump into my lecture, um, so George Aid, uh, eight, whoop, 18, 
66 to 1944. So think about that, born a year after the Civil War ended, died uh, a year before World War II ended. Very interesting lifespan. Um, Indiana born and bred, Purdue University graduate. I don't know how many of you might be Big Ten college football fans, but Ross Aid Stadium, he was one of the big fundraisers for it. Um, and again, I don't know what is going on here with my video. Um, let me try to close out some other stuff on my computer that might make more room. <clears throat> um, so uh, he graduates from Purdue University, comes to Chicago in 1891, uh, works as a reporter for a number of different Chicago papers, covering in 1893 the World's Fair, covering boxing, some of the big matches of the time. Um, and eventually he becomes a columnist and often working with John McCann, the great uh, newspaper cartoonist um, and fellow Sigma Chi fraternity graduate, um, writes two columns that, that sort of make him uh, the beginning of a wave of something that happens in American journalism, which is syndication. Uh, he wrote fables in slang and stories of the street and of the town. Um, and these ran in several papers. He moved, he was like a star. He'd go from paper to paper. <clears throat> and if you read them now, they're kind of not funny and a little stiff and kind of hard to get your head around. Um, the origins of this book uh, were at the Newbury Library in a class where I was teaching, uh, or the origins of my edition of this book, were at the Newbury Library in a class where I was teaching Chicago saloon culture. And I wanted to include aid because I'd always heard he'd written things about it and I'd heard about this book. And I went back digging and uh, found some of the fables that were set in saloons and some of the other ones. And I read a lot of them. And I'm, I couldn't see what the appeal was exactly. And then finally, I read one where it became clear to me. And that was one where it, it dramatized just how different a social world we live in, that where Abe came from. And this was one where uh, the plot was your middle class, pretty successful businessman is coming home after a long day at work. And he's a little worried because his wife's been looking to hire a new, uh, basically, servant, a maid a woman who would help around the house with the cooking and cleaning, a woman who would, you know, literally live in their home and be their servant. This was totally commonplace uh, for middle-class Americans up until, pro, uh, up until the depression. Uh, labor was cheap. And that's why I like to hear a Chicago person, a lot of apartments have these weird little rooms back by the kitchen, right? That's where the, the servant would assume to be living someday. And he gets home and the servant that his wife has hired is a woman from the small town he grew up in in Indiana who he went to grade school with. And it's this weirdly awkward social situation that is completely alien to us today. And that's why I think a lot of AIDS stuff is still out of print. Uh, editors go back and look at it and they're just like, what is this? I don't know. But back in the 1890s in the first decade of the 20th century, people ate it up with a spoon. He made so much money um, off the publication of these books or the syndication of the columns and publications of book collections that he could afford to just retire from being a journalist. Um, he became an early screenwriter um, and director of films here in Chicago in, and he went on to Broadway where he wrote uh, musicals, basically sort of Gilbert and Sullivan-ish things. In 1904, he had three musicals on Broadway at the same time. First playwright ever to accomplish that feat. I think maybe the last two. Um, so he was this really big deal. And then, he like I said, he retires. He basically becomes um, an occasional writer. He's living off his investments. Um, he's a Republican political uh, power. Uh, Taft began his 1908 presidential campaign at uh, AIDS mansion or estate in Richmond, Indiana. Um, but he was this, like, the politics of the day are really complicated and weird. And he was a staunch Republican, yet totally a wet. And that is like not how it usually went. Um, and there's other complications about his identity I'll dig into shortly. Um, but the Old Time Saloon he wrote and published, originally self-published, and then it, it came out in an edition for sale um, in 1931. And he was writing it uh, as part of the movement to repeal prohibition. Um, he had, there's this rhetorical thing throughout the book, including in the subtitle, 
not wet, not dry, just history, where he's claiming to be neutral, to just be giving you the facts, let you figure the facts out what they mean, not advocating a particular political position, but he's very clearly a wet. Um, he believed that uh, government's job was not to regulate morality and that the saloon, for all the things it did that sort of earned it its early demise, <clears throat> was overall a positive thing. And that drink in and of itself was not sinful or shameful. Um, so one important aspect of this book had uh, to be able to work with the OC Press to get it back into print. Uh, Maggie Hivner, an editor down there, worked with me on it. Uh, she also did the City on the Make edition that I, I did back in 01 with Dave Schmickens. Uh, very into getting Chicago stuff back into print. Um, but this book is, should be in print and, and accessible to people because it's one of the very few representations we have of what saloon culture was like by someone who wasn't trying to shut all the saloons down. There are scores of books uh, depicting the evil excesses of saloon culture, um, some of it accurately, some of it exaggeratedly. Um, if you wanna look for representations of saloon culture before prohibition, the odds are you're gonna run into nothing but the, the negative. Um, and Aid talks about the negative in this book, but he's also talking about the positive and trying to put both in context of a culture and an economy um, and a world where things like getting together and singing along with your friends was what people did for entertainment. Um, so, and here I'll acknowledge some of my sources. Uh, Daniel Ockrent's great book, Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition, uh, where his original working title was, "What the hell? How the Hell Did That Happen? Uh, Prohibition Shut Down the Fifth Largest Industry in the Country. So picture that happening now. That, by the way, now would be the media, broadly defined. So hmm, good luck with that. Um, Lisa McGear's book, uh, The War on Alcohol, and Madeline Stang's uh, Faces Along the Bar, Law and Order in the Working Man's Saloon. But it basically, and here I'll, I'll, I'll reference Northwestern. Everybody seems to think that prohibition happened because the Women's Christian Temperance Union were against fun. Uh, it's often depicted as men versus women, as fun versus dour church going. Um, and this is really not the case. It's a really um, inaccurate vision of the complexities of this culture. Uh, any issue where you can put, uh, or where a political issue where Jane Addams and the Ku Klux Klan are on the same side, you've got a complicated political issue. And both Adams and the Klan were pro-prohibition or were dries. Um, the temperance movement's roots are interesting and important, and I'm not gonna belabor them too much because I get the sense that you all probably know this, you know, back in the 18th and 19th century, America was renowned for its alcoholic excess. Um, Akrent quotes a guy, a French visitor, describing Americans who drink from dawn till dawn. Um, the, the culture was soaked in beer and cider and whiskey and rum. Um, every business deal was made at the local tavern, which was the public meeting spot. Court sessions were held in the tavern. The tavern or the inn was the the only public building often, that's where trials would take place. And so people were drinking all the time, won't get into the whiskey rebellion or any of that stuff. It just, we were renowned the world around for our boozing. Um, <clears throat> in a culture with no understanding as we have of the combination of genetic and social factors that can cause alcoholism, understood as a disease rather than a moral failing, um, a movement for temperance begins starting in the uh, 1810s and 1820s. And it's largely parallel and kind of Venn diagram overlapping with abolitionism. Tended to be Protestant uh, New Englanders and Midwesterners, including people in Ohio, um, who were also you know, against slavery for the same reason. They felt it hurt families, or one of the same reasons. And because they didn't understand how alcoholism works, temperance doesn't fly, right? Just drink less, not prohibited. But then drinking less isn't working, so abs abstinence becomes the movement. You want to have total abstinence. You swear that you will never have a drop ever again if you've had it before or never at all if you haven't in the first place. And believe it or not, that 
stuff begins in Ireland with a guy named Father Matthew, <clears throat> the Cork Total Abstinence Society. There's a statue of him on Patrick Street in Cork City with four pubs within spitting distance uh, because, of course, who needs it, right? Um, after the abstinence movement doesn't really gain a lot of traction, uh, it turns into a movement to uh, prohibit alcohol being sold at all. And before prohibition was passed in our, uh, passed in 18, uh, 1919, enacted in 1920, 40% of the country was already dry from local uh, option ordinances. The whole states were dry. Kansas was dry. Every saloon carry nation chopped up in Kansas was not supposed to exist. So think about that. That also comes into play here. Um, but the, w, the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, was not just about temperance. It was an organization devoted to lots of progressive causes. Um, they were anti-child labor. They were pro-women's uh, suffrage. Uh, they were in favor of bicycles because it helped women not get sexually harassed on public transportation. Uh, the WCTU had a, a broad portfolio of, of causes they were in favor or they were working toward. The Anti-Saloon League is the organization that mattered. The Anti-Saloon League was uh, run by a guy named Wayne Wheeler. Uh, starting in the 1880s and 90s, it became the equivalent of the uh, National Rifle Association, a laser-focused, single-issue political machine producing texts, books, pamphlets, posters. Um, maybe later I'll dig some up <clears throat> uh, from my computer. Uh, and a speakers bureau, if you wanted a speaker to give a four-hour speech against the evils of alcohol, they would find a guy and send them out to you. If you wanted to send a letter to the editor of your local paper in favor of prohibition, <clears throat> they would send you form letters that you could retype yourself, sort of like astroturfing we see now politically, right? Um, here's the form letter you send to your congressman from whatever organization you're in favor of. Um, but I think the best way to understand how prohibition came to be in the way that uh, we can see from this book is it's an argument about who gets to be an American and whose cultural practices are acceptable as American. Um, the dries tended to be uh, small town and rural. They tended to be Protestant, especially Baptist and Methodist. They tended to be what they themselves called Native Americans, which meant immigrants who came over long enough ago that they don't remember the old country from English speaking or Germanic backgrounds. And uh, women dominated, even though again, Wayne Wheeler was kind of the big, the big wheel, so to speak, with the ASL. <clears throat> Wets tended to be urban, Roman Catholic and Jewish, uh, immigrant, and both men and women, but men kind of dominate the wet side of things. Um, and immigrants, of course, brought their, the, what we, I would call their drinking culture with them. Um, Irish whiskey and German lager being perceived as threats to American identity. Um, the same way, if you think back to 16, you know, if Hillary Clinton wins, there'll be a taco truck on every corner. Well, in, the, in this period, they were afraid of the Irish opening whiskey uh, pubs and the Germans opening beer gardens where women and children are in the same presence as people drinking beer, it would be the end of the world. Um, and <clears throat> the public nature of the saloon, um, being on street corners with open doors and windows, being audible and sniffable from outside, being just there on the street and being in such huge numbers. Aid talks about this a lot. I mean, the, the saloon brought its demise on by overproduction. There were so many saloons, they started competing with each other. They started breaking the law. They started flouting the community morals of even places like Chicago, believe it or not. Um, so that sort of sets up the, the image of the saloon and the culture as an evil that if you eliminate that, all other evils will go away. Uh, working class men will bring their paychecks home to their families instead of cashing in at the saloon. Uh, literally, they predicted the jails and the madhouses will be empty and the poorhouses will be empty. Everything in America, that's wrong with America, will be fixed if we can just get rid of, this, <clears throat> get rid of the saloon. Not really, it didn't happen. Um, the things that enabled it to happen, though, were important. The 16th Amendment, uh, creating the Internal Revenue Service, um, allowed the federal government to make money off something other than excise on, taxes on alcohol, either imported or domestic produced. And that's why, by the way, it's called the Internal Revenue Service. 
right? You're paying internal taxes as opposed to tariffs, frankly. Um, World, the Great War created a wave of anti-German sentiment that was, got focused on brewers, Pabst und Schlitz und Müller und Budweiser und Bush. A lot of those guys still had like mansions back in Bavaria and were active fundraisers for the central powers, you know, selling German war bonds to their workers. Um, so that all sort of comes together in a perfect storm uh, along with uh, the phenomenon of the Tide House, uh, English syndicates, uh, um, aid calls them, buying up chains of saloons, which lead to pressure to sell as much beer as you can, which leads to law breaking and et cetera. Um, so aid <clears throat> totally nails this all, looking back over his own life and it's kind of walks through in this book, the different ways of thinking about saloons that are important and un undercutting some of the, um, the misrepresentations from the dries. He is completely on, on board with acknowledging the excesses of saloon culture that took place. But he also puts it in a context of uh, rural and urban working class men needing somewhere to go where they are um, welcome. There's a great line, <clears throat> um, maybe my favorite line in the whole book is uh, the saloon was the rooster crow of the spirit of democracy. And this doesn't just fit in with the, the past of the saloon where it was, you know, where all political meetings took place. I know Liz always likes talking about that, like in the colonial period, the saloon was the place. But the, the line before that, the saloon gave boisterous welcome to every male adult, regardless of his private conduct, his clothes, his manners, his previous record, or his ultimate destination. Right, so it was a, a non-judgmental place. Didn't matter if you were maybe gonna go to hell because you were a sinner. If you were an adult man properly dressed, in, come on in, you know, it's a place for people to be. Um, he talks about, you know, there's an image of the saloon as a place of uh, sexual misconduct and he acknowledges, you know, the painted ladies a couple times, but the vast majority of saloons, he says, you know, men go in to brag about they have the best wife in the world even if they're at the saloon rather than home with their wives, or they brag about their children's successes in school. Um, they, he, he talks about the way that it's a place where people create art together. And this is something, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting about this kind of historical work is we forget about lack of things in the past. <clears throat> people, before the CD-ROM, before the, the internet jukebox now, like till a few weeks ago, you go into saloons where every song on the internet was available. And before that you had CDs and before that you had 45s and maybe you have a sound system, a record player, whatever. Before that you might have a band playing, but before that, what did you have? You had four guys who did barbershop quartet and sang together, right? And that was part of this creation of community that saloons are so central to both in small towns and in big cities. Um, the things that I most love about uh, the book besides that are how funny it is. He's just a smooth and entertaining writer. Um, the illustrations are great. I'll try to call some of those up if they, um, seems like if you're using Zoom and you wanna show illustrations and you have them queued up, they will be eliminated to make room for Zoom. I've learned this in the last two days. Um, and the politics are astute. You know, he's very much attuned to gender politics, including some complexities that um, regarding his own masculinity, he was almost certainly gay, and that complicates things immensely. Um, but I'll segue, I'll, I'll talk for a minute now about how I think this might speak to our current world, and then we'll get into some Q&A. Um, but basically, <clears throat> depending on how long this shutdown goes on, locally in Chicago and Illinois or nationally, it's gonna fundamentally change American culture of third places. Uh, so many bars, just don't have the capital to not be open for two or three or four months. Even successful large places have mortgages. And unless their banks freeze their mortgage like they're doing in Italy and some other countries mandated by the government, um, I suspect after this is over, uh, we're going to look at a, a landscape with, I mean, in the last 25 years, we've gone from several thousand uh, tavern licenses in Chicago to fewer than 800, fewer than 900 
I can see that being cut in half pretty easily, including not just, again, oddly, I think some of the corner dive bars might survive because they were never full anyway. And if they've got landlords who would rather not have empty storefronts, it might work. But any place that has, you know, 75 or 100 employees in a $30,000 monthly nut, I don't know if they're going to be back. And that will fundamentally transform uh, Chicago's bar culture. Um, and, you know, back in the 19th, uh, you know, the, teen, the teens, 20s, and 30s, you know, the, the sort of uh, economic uh, catastrophe of the Great Depression, which it looks like we're headed for another one of, right? Unemployment's already higher than it was then. It hasn't, the, the numbers haven't been counted yet, but everything I've read says we're looking at 25 or 30% unemployment. Um, that did lead to the repeal of prohibition. Um, which was a radical change. I mean, uh, the repeal forces argued that we should be paying, you know, letting people sell and buy alcohol and pay taxes on it and create jobs by doing that. Um, I find it hard to picture though, some kind of radical realignment or radical adjustment to the economy coming out of this in base, partly based on quote leadership unquote in Washington, uh, partly based on, I'm not sure what you do other than stop the banks from collecting mortgages and therefore landlords not having to collect rent. And I just, I find that hard to picture, but I can't picture anything else that will basically save the, the third places we now value so much, the bars and restaurants and coffee shops and, you know, other places. Um, but the real value of this book, I hope, is simply to uh, enrich our understanding of that period in history uh, before uh, prohibition happened, how prohibition happened, the political complexities of it, and then to just sort of have that in mind as we look around the world we live in now and try to figure out what's next because you never know what's coming next. Um, but if you know what happened before, you might be better prepared to conceptualize where things might go. Um, all right, that is what I had to say. I'd like to now have a conversation. If anyone has any questions about the book itself, particular passages, um, imagery in the book, uh, stuff, uh, we can rock and roll. Should I look at the chat room? What's going on in the chat room? Not read, cannot get the book yet. Read it, just finished, okay. They probably aren't empty now. What's not empty? <laughs> so if you wanna post a question there, I can respond. If you wanna just unmute yourself and talk, if that's easier, if you're on the phone or whatever. Those of you who are visually muting, that's fine, especially you, Harvey, uh, but whatever. I'm having a pretzel. So, Bill, this is Eric. Um, my first question, you started to touch on this. Um, a large theme of the book, and it's repeated often, is that the saloons brought prohibition on themselves. And you mentioned sort of the, the overabundance of saloons and therefore the competition and therefore the fudging right. of rules. It also struck me that there was a laziness and they got caught flat-footed when the competition came to take them down. I'm just, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Absolutely. their attitude and why they were caught so flat-footed and, and so on. Um, it's absolutely, well, they were caught flat-footed. Uh, and this is a, a part of the book I really love. Um, where is page? So, well, a couple things. Number one, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to this, the over-competition. Cities like Chicago didn't have property taxes. They didn't have uh, parking meters and we don't anymore again. <laughs> um, the city made a substantial amount of its money off tavern licenses. So they granted them. Take it. Yeah, sure. As many as you, well, here's another one, another X number of hundred dollars a year in the, to pay for cops, to get paid off by the saloon keepers to not enforce the law. But the actual uh, liquor industry was divided. Distillers and brewers didn't get along. Vintners were their own little weird thing. Um, so um, during the buildup to uh, prohibition, the uh, distillers tried to blame all the excesses of the saloon on the beer guys. And the beer, the brewers tried to blame it all on the hard liquor guys. Beer tried to sell itself as a healthful family beverage, right? Um, wine survived because of sacramental wine. So the industry itself was divided. There wasn't a solid single, um, you know, lobbying effort to fight. Plus, Associating yourself with the saloon meant associating yourself with 
drunks, brawlers, prostitutes. Who wants to do that, right? And this is a, was a big deal in uh, the late eight, late nine, eight, well, the late 80s through the 90s into the early aughts. Um, politicians who wish they had sort of stood up to the vote precincts dry movement on the south and west sides of Chicago. Because you vote a precinct dry and then a restaurant won't open because you can't get a liquor license. A supermarket won't open if it can't sell beer. And several politicians were quoted in a story Pat Reardon did for the Tribune basically saying, you can't, and I think Tony Preckwinkle was one of them. She was an alderman at the time saying, well, you can't be on the side of the bars. Like they're perceived by the churchgoers as Satan. Um, but there's a lot, there's a bit on page 26 of this book, um, or 25 to 26. You can condense the whole situation into the following statement, whole situation of 1920. The non, and this is in bold caps, so that didn't start with Twitter. <laughs> the non-drinkers had been organizing for 50 years and the drinkers had no organization whatever. They had been too busy drinking, right? So the industry itself didn't, wasn't unified. There wasn't a National Restaurant Association or an Illinois Restaurant Association or a hospitality industry organization like we have now. But the, the main reason that the saloons brought this on themselves was, again, overproduction. There were too many of them. When you have too many saloons, you compete with each other. The competition ends up being, well, I don't really want these guys to have a card game at my back table, but if I don't let them do it, they'll just go across the street. And I don't really want this girl work in the bar, but if I keep her out, she'll be across the street and so will my customers who patronize her. Uh, well, I don't really want to serve these underage kids, but they're bringing a pal of beer home to dad. And if I don't serve them, the guy across the street will. And that just brought the whole, uh, oh, somebody just made a big noise. So that's, that's the main thing, uh, the main lesson I think from aid and from Ockrent and, and the historical sources. Um, a combination of disorganization in the industry itself and actual excesses that earned the saloon what it got. Oh, Paul DeRica. All right, so I'm asking, I've got a, a question over in the chats. Oh, the hole in the wall tavern's probably on empty now. I think most of them are, um, except for, of course, uh, Richards. <laughs> Richards, fuck that. Um, <laughs> How did, how did breweries and distilleries survive prohibition? Size and resources. There's talk about how the current crisis will bring about an end to the, a lot of craft breweries. Should we anticipate post-prohibition moment where only a handful of breweries and distilleries survived? Um, breweries and distilleries survived by three different routes. One was continuing to brew and distill illegally. Lots of places worked with organized crime. You know, one of the things I most despise, and I, that's, a few of you will laugh at this having heard me say this before, is the whole image of Capone and the outfit as like industrial engineers digging tunnels into places and as though they you know, somehow magically produced all this beer. They took over extant breweries, some of whom were closed and looked close on the outside. But you know, you've been around a brewery, you know how it smells. People knew what was going on. Others, uh, they, they uh, made so soft drinks or they made near beer, which was still legal, um, distilleries, some of them survived by making beer for the federal government because you could sell, not necessarily, you could prescribe medicinal whiskey. So there are, you can, you can go, on, go on eBay, you can get prescriptions for alcohol during prohibition. The, the law was riddled with exceptions and, and crazy loopholes, let's say. Um, but as soon as prohibition ended, Paul, I think your question is right on target, who could start up? Well, all the big breweries that had shifted to soft drinks and near beer were still capitalized really powerfully. What this is going to do is anybody who opened a brew pub six months ago with his brother-in-law who's a home brewer and they got some good recipes and they got a five-year lease on a nice spot, you know, down by this train station, um, they're fucked. They don't have the capital to get through this. Um, I don't think that the larger and more successful Craft breweries are in danger, but the, the number I had in the book at the, um, and I won't be able to find the note, but it was something, it was in the introduction. Uh, in 20, November 2015, there were 4,144 uh, breweries in the United States. I'm 
pretty sure it got up over 4,900. It might have gotten to 5,000. That'll probably be cut in half um, simply because of the number of the, the capitalization. You got to have big money. Um, I think the distilleries are the distilleries and, and big breweries are going to make it, but it's the small guys that are screwed. Next, one of the writers Aid mentions is Finley Peter Dunn of the Mr. Dooley character, worth reading today. Yes, where's JF Foley? Yes, yes, yes to that question, or JJ Foley. Um, Dunn was friends with Dooley, or pardon me, Dunn was friends with Aid. As soon as you start talking about Dooley and Dunn, you start mixing the names up. <clears throat> and uh, his depiction of uh, Mr. Dooley, an Irish bartender on Archer Avenue down in Bridgeport, is another very positive depiction of pre-prohibition saloon culture. Um, it's also a very uh, nuanced and interesting depiction of Irish American culture um, that gets away from the stage Irishman and the uh, sort of uh, stereotypes of the Irish priest and politician and barkeep and cop uh, to really dig into the immigrant experience and the experience of living in Chicago. Um, Mr. Dooley and Peace and in War is the collection that made him a national name. Um, like Aid, he kind of then got too big for Chicago and went off, and the later collections aren't as good. Um, Mr. Dooley and Peace in the War, I believe, is the only one that's in print, but the others are all really commonly available on used book sites because they're, he was so popular, print, printed tens of thousands of them are out there. Um, but there's four or five in Mr. Dooley and Peace in the War that I can't recommend highly enough um, on criminals, you know, about why one kid grows up to be a bad guy while his siblings are all you know, good kids, what's, there's some poison in the life of a big city, he says. Um, and there's three or four others where it's about, uh, it's, you know, it's set in a bar to some degree, but it's more a narrative of the city, of industrial life and immigrant life. So definitely dive into Dunn. Okay, a lot of, a lot of practices AIDS mentioned were uh, banned after prohibition, tied houses. Uh, then we got the three-tier distro. Do you think policies will change wholesale after this? Argus and Pullman, alas, just went out of business. So Another one bites the dust. I don't think the three, I'll say, for those of you don't know, the three-tier distribution method was set up after prohibition to ensure that we would not have the, the abuses of the Tide House. The abuses of the Tide House were pretty straightforward. I am Schlitz, I own this bar. I have paid for everything in it. You will sell only my beer and you will sell as much of it as possible or I'll hire somebody else to do it for me. Um, the bar keeps were not owners of the saloon. They were merely employees. They were more likely to uh, you know, abuse the system. And so after prohibition that was outlawed, now it's a three-tier system where if, if I brew beer, I have to sell it to a distributor who then sells it to the retailer who then sells it to you. So it creates a layer of cost that makes everything more expensive, but it creates independence theoretically. Um, this gets stupidly complicated and there's been some nuances added to it. You know, a few years ago when Haymarket Brewing opened, you know, Pete Crowley couldn't put a keg of beer in his trunk of his car and drive it to Hopleaf. He had to sell it to somebody who would put it in their truck, who would drive it to Hopleaf and sell it to Hopleaf. Um, I believe they've made a few changes that make it a little simpler, a little more straightforward. Um, but I don't believe that the three-tier system will go away uh, because the big guys like it. And yeah. Oh, sorry. I guess just to um, just to add to that, I mean, I guess more like some of the happy hour laws or the cabaret laws, you know, just some of these other things, these relics that might be you know, in the interest of well, economic the development hour, change. The happy hour law was, re was repealed. You can have happy hour again. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's, that's a change. But in terms of uh, how the distribution method should be altered to make things better for people, that's a tough one. Um, so we, classic provision. Okay. So talking about, uh, from Brett Kirby to everybody, uh, you know, Aid is kind of saying that the uh, 20 Chicago wasn't what its uh, legend had it to be. Is it fake news? Um, you know, he was not living in Chicago anymore by this point. He was at his estate in Indiana or at his winter home in Miami. Um, I think he could very well have been downplaying uh, the role of organized crime in providing alcohol to Chicagoans of all stripes. Um, but if you look back at the statistics, and I just reread, I just read a book, uh, Capone's Beer Wars, and I'm blanking on the name of the author, I apologize, um, where he went back and looked at the actual um, 
statistics. And you know, it was mostly it was mostly gangsters killing other gangsters, but only Capone and one or two other outfits were Sicilian. The rest were Irish and other other forms of uh, ethnic outsiders. And speakeasies on every corner. No, that was not what it was. Um, so I think he's probably shading it down a little, but I don't think he was like covering up for anybody, basically. Um, is it, so Liz says that we, breweries fail, they're struggling prior to COVID. Yeah, but COVID is the bullet in the head. Um, Eight had deep ties to Indiana during the rise of the second clan. Did he have inter any interaction with these politics? Not that I know of. Um, again, his, as a Republican who was a wet, and again, I talk about this in the book, but for those of you who haven't read the book, he was almost certainly gay. Um, which doesn't fit with our ideas, right? A college football fanatic who was a gay Republican golfer. Those things don't add up in our algebra of identity. <clears throat> but there's a line in the, in the book, um, page 56, talking about the fact that most bars serve nothing but beer and whiskey. Um, and uh, so you would have your shot of whiskey. And they literally, when they put the bottle on the bar, which I always thought was like, some kind of Western movie affectation, but apparently not. And you would pour out a, you know, you'd have a glass and they'd watch how much you poured and charge you accordingly. But you'd take the, sh the shot uh, and a whiskey drinker wanted it to burn. That's how you knew it was good whiskey. Before he could choke to death, he felt around for the chaser and put out the fire. Not to drink your liquor straight was considered a sign of effeminacy. The idea was to uphold the reputation as a he-man no matter what happened to the lining of the stomach. Um, Aid uh, kept company for a long time with a guy named Ort, short for Orson Welles. Um, he and Welles were uh, parodied in a, in a painting on the wall of the Chapin and Gore Saloon in Chicago, where uh, Welles was shown wearing uh, clothes that were coated gay, and uh, Aid was in a dress. And they were depicted in Egypt, where they had traveled together because Aid was so rich they could do around the world tours. Um, and he depicts the saloon as a thoroughly masculine space. Uh, the only women in the book are entertainers of some kind. He mentions several female actresses or singers, prostitutes, or uh, Salvation Army lassies, uh, you know, sort of moral crusaders. Um, the saloon in his world was a masculine place, but masculine didn't necessarily mean straight. Masculine meant you drank your whiskey straight. And so it's really complicated and there's no proof. There's, I've, I've yet to find a letter or a depiction that explicitly says anything about this. Um, but, and I talk about this in my notes, when Wells died in the late thirties, um, uh, Aide wrote his obituary for the Daily News and the subhead on the obituary was a labor of love. And that could be read two ways, either uh, Aid was returning to the newspaper work, which he loved so much, or he was writing the obituary of essentially his life partner. Um, so the complications of that are really there. His racial politics are more obscure. Um, he talks a lot about blackface comedians in a totally like non-judgmental, non either against him or for him, they were just what was going on kind of way. Um, never shows any um, in any of his work that I've read, any particular sympathy for the cause of the South during the Civil War. Um, and he was, the, the resurgence of the Second Klan was a statewide thing in Indiana, of course. But I believe he was kind of more in that Northwest part of Indiana that is in the orbit of Chicago. Um, so, Capone, John Binder, thank you for the politics, or the author of uh, Capone's Beer Wars. Frankly, I wish I had edited that book because I would have eliminated, he, uh, he says, for example, 800 times. So like, just get on with it. But the, he goes through and like takes a lot of the mythology of the prohibition violence and looks at the actual statistics for what actually happened versus, you know, newspaper and movie representations. You know, they never dumped anybody's body in the river. He just left him in the car where you shot him. They didn't put him in the trunk of the car. Cars didn't have trunks. Right, so that's a book I really recommend. Um, okay, let me look at Emilia, Emiliano. Uh, the role of shipping beer directly from brewer to consumer. Uh, urban artifact. Uh, crossing state lines is complicated. I'm not going to pretend to know the, the rules about that. Um, organized crime aside, what collusion corruption do we see between the saloons and city government? 
<laughs> okay, brace yourselves. Everybody who depicts or talks about organized crime tends to look at two sides of a triangle. Criminals, bad guys who will break the law, corrupt judges, cops, politicians who are suborned and bribed by those bad guys who break the law. But without the base of the pyramid, the regular everyday citizens who are willing to break the law by buying alcohol, there's no money for the criminals to bribe the cops and judges with. So the whole idea that there's this culture of corruption that is just the politicians and the criminals is something I'm working really hard against. And the book I've never seen, or even a chapter in a book I've never seen, is the complicity of everyday citizens in all of this. And by complicity, I mean, I voted against prohibition. I think I should be able to drink beer. I'm going to drink my beer. Um, the money I give to the guy who I bought the beer from goes to the gangsters, it goes to the cops, but I got my beer. Um, no organized crime exists without regular everyday citizens being willing to break the law. Um, that's where the term scoff law comes from, by the way. <clears throat> One of the repeal organizations, uh, they call themselves the Crusaders, in order to uh, take on the mantle of religious stuff that so many prohibition uh, dries war. Um, had a contest, you know, how do you describe someone who otherwise is a law-abiding good person who drinks anyway? And scofflaw was the term that, that won the contest. And so there is a scofflaw brewing company here in Chicago, I believe. Um, so uh, actually the, the book that comes closest to this, uh, Joe Krause uh, just published a book called Kosher Capones. I can't recommend it highly enough. Really well written, really good depiction of the complexities of Jewish gangster history in Chicago and the three neighborhoods it's associated with, um, Maxwell Street, uh, Lawndale, and then Rogers Park. And, and he edges toward talking about why would regular everyday Jewish Chicagoans put up with these guys? Well, sometimes it's because they came out and beat up the Poles who were beating up the Jews for being Jews. And sometimes it's because they grew up in the same neighborhood together. Um, and sometimes it's because they also like to gamble and drink. Um, but a, an actual book focusing on not the gangsters, but the everyday people who gave the money to the gangsters. I don't even know how to, re how do you research that? You'd have to look up every damn, you know, family history ever, including my great grandfather. But anyway, that's another story. Okay, so we're getting some answers in the chat section here. Um, you can grub hub some half acre stacks of wheat, nutrients on the three tier system. Uh, delivery makes it a fourth tier, right? The person delivering that beer to you has paid a retailer or a, a, the brewer who is also licensed as a retailer. That was one of the things that got changed. The fact that brewers can sell their own product to you directly in a tap room is one of the, the breaks or the, the cracks in the three tier system. And it does vary from state to state. Oh, excellent. Yes, all the world is here. Um, what was which books? To, oh, uh, Joe Kraus. Uh, I, I suppose I can type here. Might be just Kraus. Uh, Rick Kogan had a great um, story about this book in the Tribune five, six months ago. So you can dig it up. And I might be misspelling Krauss. Even though I went to grad school with him, I should know his name. Oh yeah, fuck Grubhub, fuck Uber Eats, fuck all of them. If you're trying to support your local restaurant and, or bar that is closed right now, except for takeout and, and delivery, go order from them directly or go there and get it yourself. Uh, the cut they, that Grubhub takes is obscene. Uh, San Francisco recently mandated that they couldn't take more than 15%, and yet they're still doing business there. So they could make money doing that. And I don't mean to mess with the guys who are trying to make a living in gig, a gig economy by continuing to be Grubhub or Uber Eats drivers. But, you know, restaurants were willing to do that third, that cut to, to get new business in and to like just sort of break even, sell a little more, maybe get somebody who'll then come to the restaurant. But in, in this world right now, it doesn't help them stay open, which is what we're trying to do is keep them open. All right, we got time for more questions. I, I'm going to try to look up something on my computer while we do this and do a share image thing. Bill, I, this is Eric again. I've got a question. Sure. 
Um, pleading a bit of ignorance here, were there anti-saloon folks that who they themselves personally were wet? Um, were there, there were anti-saloon, there were politicians who voted anti-saloon who were personally wet because the Amer uh, anti-saloon league didn't care what you did. They cared how you voted. The strategy they used throughout was, uh, get, okay, so in most, this is pre-gerrymandering America. In most uh, jurisdictions at the state level and the federal level, you'd have like 40% wet, 40% dry, 40% didn't give a shit, or 20% didn't give a shit. So if you really rallied the, the crowd on either side, you could take an election. So they got people at the state level and the federal level to basically pledge to vote dry when the time came or lose the next election. Um, lots of uh, people, they, and they, they were explicit about it. They're like, you're, whatever you do, you do. Um, and then when there was a vote on the federal level for the, the amendment, it was the first amendment with a time limit and the peop a lot of people who voted for it thought that meant it wouldn't pass because no amendment before it had it. It was just like passed or not passed. You know, it had, was sort of open-ended. And it passed really quickly. It passed in like 13 months or something um, because the Anti-Saloon League didn't just organize at the House and the Senate. They organized at all the state levels. Each state was primed to pass it. So they did. And there were plenty of people who were like, oh, fuck, I never thought this would actually happen. So they voted dry to save their political careers while personally being wet. Absolutely. We see that today in various forms, I think, if I'm not being too cynical about stuff, right? <laughs> I mean, how many, think about the number of anti-choice politicians who've been exposed having paid for abortions or anti-gay politicians who end up getting caught in a, you know, gay sex ring, right? What you do politically and what you do personally there's always been a nice gap there in American culture. But I pulled up an image for you to talk about the Anti-Saloon League. Let's see if it stays here. This is a poster that's in the Westerville Public Library in Ohio, which has the artifacts or the archives of the Anti-Saloon League. And this is how they always put it. You can either choose the saloon or you can choose the boys and girls of America. Um, I love the, the boy's little knickers and his sort of quasi-military outfit there. Um, the real issue, they called it. Um, and I learned yesterday that I need to like close these before I open other ones because it crashes. Okay. Otherwise, stop sharing. I'm going to just bring up a few images for you guys. Um, go a, here's another one. Which gets the vote, your mother or the saloon? And yes, that's Whistler's mother. But I think that's an anti-saloon league poster right there. I don't recall that being in the, <laughs> in the original. And let's see if we got one more lined up. This one's great. This is maybe my favorite one. I'll just, frankly, I'll top off my beer while you take in that image. So, vote wet for my sake, the fat, corpulent brewer with his top hat and his beer gut and his Monopoly man look, right? Vote dry for mine, the little boy, I love the, there's always, the little boy always has a tie on. Um, and the girl and the infant. It's like, hmm, shall the mothers and children be sacrificed? It's up to you, voter, to decide. You know, when you put it this way, I can see being persuaded. Of course, this is a false just dilemma, right? Why not put dry with the, the women and children and wet with the local bartender and his wife and kids, right? Or the people who work in the brewery. I mean, again, the fifth largest industry in the United States shut down over moral panic from one side of our cultural divide. Um, and if you look at uh, the map for votes in favor of prohibition and the map of the last several presidential elections, 
they are for all practical purposes identical. The blue red divide of America in 2020 is the same divide that brought us prohibition in 1920. Just look at the fucking maps, right? There's no other, there's no way to put it. I hate to be so blatantly political, but it is. Eric, I, you unmuted, you wanna talk? <laughs> I was just gonna say not wet, not dry, just history. Mm -hmm. Not red, not blue, just reality. Any, any last questions? We're coming in. I can also, I'm going to pull up one other image that may, means I have to sort of delve into my computer deeper because for whatever reason, this thing doesn't like to do what I want it to do. But while I do this, there can be talking and other questions. Where is this image? I hate it when nobody talks, but I can't make you talk. I'll throw out, oh, you got the image? Yep, but go ahead, you ask your question. This, this oh no, question. just, you know, I, a couple years ago, I was working on a prohibition tour for the Chicago History Museum, and I came across aid in a way that I didn't anticipate, which apparently there was some whiskey ring that was running uh, whiskey illegally through the Chicago Athletic Association. Ah. So basically this guy was procuring booze from Canada and shipping it to the Chicago Athletic Association, which still exists right now as that kind of boutique hotel. Right. Uh, and Aid was one of the people identified in the article as having purchased like several cases of whiskey and was like keeping them in his rooms there. And purportedly the Chicago Athletic Association is also um, was a club that a lot of um, closeted Chicagoans belong to right. as well at that era. But, well, yeah, so absolutely. And I so would advise, was a stop law. I mean, right. he was <laughs> I would advise going to the CA once it reopens, the mm. lobby bar up one flight of stairs up and the game room behind it. You're basically in the same place that Aid occupied. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. They acknowledge in their own little inner tours that this was a place where, you know, this was the gay club for Chicago's rich elite. Mm. Um, the fact that Aid would get busted for buying cases of scotch while denying the existence of speakeasies. Mm. Um, you know, the private clubs and people with their private wine cellars in their homes always continued to be able to get alcohol because of class power, mm. right? Well, one of the other things, and this, this is Lisa McGear's book is really good about this, uh, The War on Alcohol. One of the reasons why prohibition finally gets brought down is the, the perception, the just perception by a majority of Americans that the law was being unfairly enforced on the poor and on the minorities. And, you know, rich people can get away with it and poor people go to jail for it. Um, and the Klan, back to Rudy's question earlier, the Klan was one of the vigilante groups that helped regular law enforcement enforce prohibition laws against poor whites as well as blacks in not just Indiana, but in the South as well. Um, so that kind of violence and disproportionality helped bring change. And maybe that's happening now with marijuana laws, finally. I mean, we still live in prohibition. It's just different substances. Um, but the reason I called up this image, this is the last image in the book. Uh, the last line of the text is uh, Aid saying, you know, you wouldn't want to bring back the saloon and have him uh, reincarnate him and turn him loose again. But then there's this picture on the opposite page. So, oh, yes, is kind of the last words of the book. And this bartender looks remarkably like Ernest Hemingway. Um, and the artist, Harrison Fisher, was an artist who did a lot of covers for magazines like Cosmopolitan, which used to be like a high-end fiction and culture magazine, not what it's become in since. Um, and Harrison's portrait of F. Scott Fitzgerald is in the National Portrait Gallery. So I'm 100% sure this is Ernest Hemingway, right? You want Hemingway to be your bartender? Sure, that'd be great. Um, the other image I wanna sh dig in for you the guys though, based on Okay, I need to stop sharing, which goes there, and then I minimize this. Nope, I maximize that. And there, the, the, the painting I mentioned earlier of Aid and uh, Wells. Oop. Mm, it's not appearing, oh, there it is. So 
So this was on the wall at the Chapin and Gore Saloon. Um, the Chicago History Museum, I believe, has a collection of about 30 odd of these port celebrity portraits. Um, people who visited the bar who were famous like Bismarck or Prince of Wales or whatever, um, they would put this sort of thing up. The only other two that have anything about gender built into them uh, was a woman whose name I'm blanking on, she's in the notes, who cross-dressed as a man and was a doctor, a surgeon during the Civil War and actually won the Medal of Honor. And the other's Oscar Wilde. So AIDS, gen, AIDS gender identity was widely enough known that a, a saloon, the equivalent of Gibson's nowadays, would put this on their wall and nobody thought about it twice. The logo right here is the logo of the Chicago Athletic Club. Uh, this red tie was a signal the way that purportedly like bandanas in your back pocket were a signal once. And again, AIDS in a dress and the, this uh, little box here says fables and slang <clears throat> because he made the money to be able to afford a world tour with his boyfriend because of that thing. And I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, chat, people are chatting at me. Um, yep, Wells is holding the athletic club C. And it was in the, the out in Chicago thing. That's where we met, Liz. Why don't you unmute yourself and we can wrap this up. We've gone a little over. Let me stop the sharing. Hi. All right, you want to do our extra? Oh, sure. Wait, are you done? I, any, I mean. If you have more questions, I can talk longer. I don't know. This is interesting as hell. <laughs> You've heard all this before, though. <laughs> I know. Uh, but yes, we did meet at the out uh, in Chicago exhibition yep. where you um, and Dan did something, did something for us for that whole series. Um, Bill, thank you very much Welcome. for a lovely talk as always. Uh, thank you all for joining us for another Bruseum event. Remember to join us on Thursday where we completely switch gears and talk about Malort. Um, and we will do the traditional Malort O'Clock community shot. Uh, I will be sipping, not shooting. Oh, geez, I've got something else to do. What a sad. <laughs> Love or hate I'm it. I'm just going to drink favorite. sand. Um, well, we're going to actually introduce a beer cocktail with it, too. So maybe we can get you to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brett, you got to give it a try. Come on. Uh, next week, uh, Australian beer historian Peter Simons is going to talk about some beer history in Australia. Um, and we've got actually a lot of things in the, dare I say it, hopper, um, coming up for you throughout May. You've got a lot on tap too, I see. A lot on tap, a lot in the hopper. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, as we, um, referred to earlier, Bill is going to do another book club for us uh, in May, and that will be The Sun Also Rises, so. Uh, As Hemingway portrait earlier, and let me just say that's a book where, a book club meeting where I might get, um, I'm not gonna expect anybody necessarily have read it, but I, it'll be a little more literary, because the representations of uh, drinking culture among the expat, lost generation, dissolute, versus the uh, Basque peasants, um, and the sort of sense of the world coming to an end then, is really interesting and important. So um, if you're thinking about joining us for that one and, and spread the word, uh, you don't have to have read the book, but if you've read the book, it'll be a little richer for you when I'm done. Yes, two completely different uh, books uh, to start out book club. But anyway, um, thank you again, everybody for joining us. Thanks, Bill. And we hope to see you. you Thursday, if not next week, if not next time. Right. Thanks to everybody. Nothing happens without an audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>